Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're going to be talking about Elon Musk's interview with the Wall Street Journal for their CEO council last night. We've also got a new analyst note and price target from UBS, we've got an update on China, the Model Y, and a couple of IPO spinoffs that are either happening or being discussed. All right, so quite a day for the stock markets today. The NASDAQ finished up just over 3%, and I mentioned the NASDAQ first because this was actually the second best day for the NASDAQ in the last 12 months, and the best day in the last nine months. So Tesla today, a happy participant in that macro rise, Tesla finishing up about 4.2% to $1,051.75. People kind of attributing the macro move to a few different things. Reversal of the downtrend last week seems to be a little bit less concern over the Omicron variant. Many flavor of the day options today. I guess we're pretty much doing a daily check-in on Form 4s these days. No new Form 4s last night. I do kind of wonder if Elon did sell today. We did see a little bit of a dip in mid-morning trading that deviated a bit from the overall market, so I wouldn't be surprised if that ended up being an Elon sale, but we'll see when we continue to check in on those Form 4s. All right, so first up, I want to spend a few minutes here going through the takeaways from Elon Musk's interview last night with the Wall Street Journal. I will put the link to that down in the description if you didn't have a chance to watch that. It was a little bit over 30 minutes, and in general, I thought this was a pretty good interview, definitely worth watching, and plenty of highlights for us to go through today. This was a virtual interview, so Elon streaming in from Giga Texas. The interviewer was kind of asking where he was at, and it gave him an opportunity to explain what he talked about at the shareholder meeting about the integration of essentially the floor plan of Tesla's offices, as well as their production facilities. So that was kind of a nice way to kick things off, I thought. I'm not going to go in order here, I'm going to go kind of by category more of the product stuff first, and then some of the other topics they covered. First thing that I do just want to get out of the way, and I did tweet this last night, but the interviewer actually asked Elon Musk what was up with 12.9, and he says, ha, huh, nothing as far as I know, end quote. So he was kind of laughing and saying he didn't really know where that meme came from. So I'm sure that's not going to entirely stop the speculation, but I'm happy that Elon has put at least a damper on that. Elon was also asked about the Cybertruck, and by the way, we've got a lot of quotes here, so I'm not going to do my quote end quote thing, but he did say that the Cybertruck has a lot of new technology, so it's a hard car to make, but that it will be awesome, and Tesla is still targeting volume production for 2023. That might sound like a delay, but that's the same thing that Elon had said at the shareholder meeting a couple months back, so no difference there, unless you want to maybe look into some of the words that Elon used around that date, or the omission of mentioning starter production in 2022. Personally, I thought the timeline did come across a little bit less optimistic than we have heard Elon mention in the past, but that could be for a variety of reasons and may not be an accurate interpretation anyway. And he did say again that Tesla will have a product roadmap update on the next earnings call. He did also note that he wishes the Cybertruck could be sooner and that it will probably be Tesla's best product ever, quote, something really special. The other Tesla-specific comments were in regards to the Tesla bot. Elon just again explaining that Tesla with full self-driving or autonomy is creating the most advanced practical AI for navigating the world. So just like they said at AI Day, why not leverage that into multiple form factors and the Tesla bot being an obvious choice for that. Elon saying, I think this will be quite profound. I don't know exactly when we'll get this right, but we will get it right. As for the impact of the Tesla bot, he said that it has the potential to be a generalized substitute for human labor over time. And he expanded on that, talking a little bit about how businesses should be optimized, saying that he had a friend that told him it really should be gross profit per employee, and that in his view, the fundamental constraint on that optimization is people, and that there are just not enough people. That, of course, led into his concern that I think we've all heard by now in terms of population and birth rates. As for other products, he did comment on both Neuralink and Starship. So first on Neuralink, he said that the device is working well in monkeys right now. They're really just confirming safety and reliability, and that they hope to have it in the first humans next year, pending FDA approval. As they have said before, that'll start with people with severe disability, and he said that they are cautiously optimistic. He reiterated that a couple of times, that Neuralink has a chance of being able to allow someone who cannot walk or use their arms to be able to walk again naturally. He said he, of course, doesn't want to give anybody false hope, but that he does feel like that is something that can be accomplished. As for Starship, he did spend quite a bit of time on this, and of course we have some context here from that leaked email that we had talked about a week or two back, but Elon saying, quote, man, Starship is a hard, hard, hard project, end quote. And he noted that this absorbs more of my mental energy than probably any other single thing. It is so preposterously difficult that there are times where I wonder whether we can actually do this. I think this actually gives a little bit more context to that email. I would have to guess that when Elon sent that, he was kind of feeling that way. 
He was also asked about his time allocation between SpaceX and Tesla, and he said it's about even, but it kind of depends on where, to use his word, triage is needed, and wherever the problems are at, Elon is kind of going to and helping solve. The interviewer did also kind of ask about his position at Tesla and if he had any interest in, you know, stepping down from CEO and being chief product officer, or if he was going to reclaim his chairman of the board position now that that three-year settlement is up. And he didn't really give a direct answer on those, but I don't think that was really trying to avoid the question. He just kind of laughed it off and said, you know, all these titles are made up anyway. And he noted that that was why he has filed paperwork with the SEC to officially be the techno king of Tesla, just kind of a joke on all of that. And I think it was particularly funny in this case because this is the CEO council. So a lot of CEOs making up the audience. The rest of the conversation focused on macro issues, so they talked about the infrastructure bill, budget reconciliation, all this spending, and Elon pontificated on that for a while and said, quote, honestly, I would just can this whole bill, don't pass it, that's my recommendation. He added that Tesla does not need the $7,500 tax credit. The interviewer asked about, what about support for charging network? And Elon saying, unnecessary, delete it, delete it. He said, I am literally saying get rid of all subsidies, also for oil and gas. As for what things do need to be tackled with infrastructure, Elon said airports, highways, noting that double-decker highways make sense, and of course, tunnels. His view is that as autonomy becomes viable, more cars are going to be on the road. I share that view because having an autonomous electric vehicle dramatically lowers the cost of having that vehicle on the road, and generally when the costs go down, utilization goes up. Of course, there are other counterfactors like remote work, but I don't think those are going to outweigh autonomy. Anyway, Elon was also asked about government and taxes. As for the role of government, he said they should really be acting as a referee, facilitating the game, but trying to stay out of the way. He again noted that in most cases, rules and regulations don't have an expiration date, so they last too long. There needs to be some process for elimination of those things. And the interviewer also asked why Elon was poking fun at people's age. Elon clarified he's not poking fun at aging, just believes that leaders should be of sound mind, and age can be a factor in that. As for taxes, they didn't spend a ton of time on this, but Elon's main point was that in his view, it doesn't make sense to take the job of capital allocation away from people, such as billionaires who have demonstrated great skill at capital allocation, and give it to an entity that has demonstrated poor skill in capital allocation, which is the government, in his words, and he cited a couple of examples for why he believes that. And he also added that he's not someone who's extremely libertarian and thinks the government should not do anything, just thinks we should minimize what the government does because the government's efficiency at spending is going to be lower than a competitive commercial company by a lot. He did note that he generally thinks estate taxes are good taxes. That fits with the rest of his comments because in that case, the capital is changing hands and you don't necessarily know if the new hand has the same capital allocation skill. The last topic was just some general commentary on China after an audience member had asked about it. Elon said that right now we're at an interesting point in history where basically no one has been around for the US not being the world's largest economy. And now with that being projected to change over to China in the next decade or so, it's just kind of different for everybody. Elon noted that he doesn't feel like China has fully appreciated being the big kid on the block in terms of the economy and basically said that once they become that, They should be considering how they would have wanted the big kid on the block to treat others once they're in that position. He also just clarified some comments on China in general. He's gotten some criticism on this in the past, but said, quote, I don't mean to endorse everything that China does any more than I would endorse everything that the United States does or any other country, end quote. In general, I think Elon did a pretty good job in this interview. I thought he communicated clearly. He seemed to be in pretty good spirits. And the conversation kind of wrapped up with a clip here that I just think was a good clip and I want to play to wrap up our section on this. You know, overall, I, I think, um, yeah, we are headed to, to an interesting and different world. Um, and I hope that we can remember that, you know, we're all human beings and, you know, let's, let's just try to have as, as positive, um, a relationship as possible. And, um, you know, and, and work towards mutual prosperity of humanity as a whole. So some nice thoughts there from Elon. Just to wrap up with news from Elon, we did get a couple of tweets yesterday. Elon noting that we will get an FSD beta 10.6.1 in a few days to address a few annoying issues, as Elon puts it. And then he did also say that there is going to be a holiday software update coming at some point as well. I don't think we ever really got part two of the holiday software update last year, so... Hopefully, as Elon says, there will be a lot of cool stuff in this version. 
All right, next up, we've got a price target increase and a fairly lengthy analyst note from UBS. They have increased their Tesla price target from $725 up to $1,000 now. They say that Tesla is likely to continue to beat consensus expectations in 2022 and that no rival will even get close to Tesla next year. They say this has led them to increase their estimates sharply, though they do still only estimate Tesla for 2025 to be doing about 3 million vehicles per year. You can see here how they're forecasting EV distribution by brand, so Tesla would be in that number one slot, but I had to kind of also chuckle at Toyota actually being in the third spot. I don't even know if Toyota really aspires to be in that third spot for EV volume in 2025. Anyway, that $1,000 price target, that is their base case. They do also have an upside price target and a downside price target. Their upside price target is $1,750. That assumes 1.7 million cars delivered in 2022 versus their base case at 1.4 million. But I don't think that's really driving the bulk of the difference in those price targets. They note that that upside case requires Tesla to basically exceed expectations on full self-driving milestones and the margin accompanying those milestones. Their downside case, which they have a $625 price target on, predictably the opposite situation where full self-driving milestones aren't really being met, volume is declining, maybe average selling prices and margins are declining or not rising, all those things you would kind of expect in a downside scenario. All right, next a couple of quick updates on Shanghai and Texas. First on Shanghai, it looks like we should be expecting to get the CPCA domestic and export China sales for November at 4 p.m. Beijing time on Wednesday. So that'll be 8 a.m. UTC and 3 a.m. Eastern time. So basically overnight for the U.S. We'll definitely talk about those numbers tomorrow if we do get them. I'm expecting somewhere around 60,000 in total. That's a little bit lower than I'd been expecting previously, but I am hearing some rumors about supply chain challenges. So it might be a little bit more constrained than some of those scenarios that we have been walking through, but hopefully we'll get some insight into that with those numbers tomorrow. As for Texas, I just wanted to kind of point this out in case you haven't really been following the drone footage or checked in on Texas in a while. Jeff Roberts shared some photos today, and as you can see, things are looking really good. There's a lot of activity, a lot of cars in the parking lot there at Giga Texas. Next, I just wanted to briefly raise some awareness on something that was brought up to me on Twitter. This is from an order holder for a rear wheel drive long range Model Y. This person ordered that configuration in August of 2019, and of course, Tesla hasn't built that which personally I think is fine, but unfortunately what I don't think is fine is that Tesla seems to now be emailing people in this scenario, telling them that they either need to cancel or update their orders to something that Tesla is actually making. So if my understanding is correct, basically these order holders have been in limbo for a couple of years, and now they're told to cancel or reconfigure at new pricing, and as we've talked about, Tesla has actually raised the price of the opening price long-range dual motor Model Y by $9,000 this year. Now, if the federal EV tax credit does end up passing and that ends up being $8,000, I think that would make up for a lot of the issue here, but that doesn't apply for all people, and I would love to see Tesla do at least something to make this a little bit more palatable for those people. Elon always says that Tesla strives to do the right thing, and in this case, I don't think this is it. Obviously, Tesla doesn't need those orders, but it just doesn't necessarily seem fair to those order holders. So if anyone at Tesla can raise that up, I don't know but thought it was worth mentioning. All right, last couple of things for today then. We do have some news of spinoffs. So Intel actually announcing that they are going to be IPOing their Mobileye unit. I think most of you are familiar with Mobileye. They're an autonomous vehicle company and supplier that Intel acquired back in 2017 for $15 billion. And I think it's kind of a sign of the times that they now want to IPO this, capitalize a bit on the excitement that seems to be in the market in this space right now. No valuation on this yet, but I would be very surprised if this does not exceed 50 billion. Definitely will be an interesting one to follow, and I do like that it'll give us a little bit more insight into how their business is developing over time without it being mixed into Intel's financials. Intel does plan to, though, retain a majority stake once they do IPO Mobileye. The other spinoff story that we have is coming from Reuters. They are reporting that Volkswagen is still exploring an initial public offering of Porsche. We had heard rumors about this potential earlier this year, but since has gone pretty quiet. But Reuters citing two sources for this report. They did say that Porsche has called the report, quote unquote, pure speculation, and that Volkswagen did not comment. We do also have one more report from Reuters on Volkswagen, and this is in relation to the ongoing uncertainty, I guess, regarding Herbert Diess's position at Volkswagen. 
Reuters is reporting that two people familiar with the matter have told them that Deese will likely stay on as CEO, but that as part of a solution to the dispute that has been happening here, he is likely to cede some responsibilities. So I think probably good for Volkswagen that Deese is remaining, but I think if they reduce Deese's authority, that just amplifies the situation that we've been talking about, about Volkswagen kind of pulling in two different directions. I mean, that's kind of inherent, right? If they were happy with the direction Deese was moving things in, they probably wouldn't give a whole lot more responsibility to someone else. And if they're giving responsibility to someone else, it's likely because that person has a different vision than Deese. This period of time of disruption, in my view, is not a period of time where you want to have a lot of different voices suggesting a lot of different things. You want to have a clear vision, a clear voice, leading everyone in the same direction. And that does not seem to be where Volkswagen is going to end up here. So we'll see on that, but that will wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and we'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, December 8th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.